chew on this. <laughs> but like cats, this is going to be like, no. They came around like, you. Stay in here. you don't like me and I don't like you, but I see you've accidentally domesticated a bunch of rats. <laughs> right. <laughs> I can take care so. of that for you for some warm milk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> chew on this. Dog food for thought with Kimberly. Chew on this. <laughs> Welcome to Chew on This, a dog podcast. My name is Kimberly, and I'm going to be your host. This is my podcast. So, on this podcast, I want to talk about dogs, because they're awesome, right? Yeah. Everybody wants to talk about dogs, so here we are. Um, in each episode, we're going to talk about breeds, mostly. Um, today's episode is going to be a little bit different because I want to talk about the relationship between people and dogs, kind of lay groundwork before we go into specific breeds of dogs. I am here with Dan. Hi, everybody. He is my boyfriend and my... <laughs> and there's Fox. Snoring <laughs> if you, in the background. If you couldn't hear him snoring. Um, Dan is going to be my sort of co-host, kind of help me, uh, with the, like... You know, conversation part of having a podcast. So uh, you will be hearing him often. But I'm just going to start off a little bit about me. Um, and then we can just take it from there and see how it goes. So my name is Kimberly. I grew up in the mountains of Colorado in a very small little town. Um, just one brother, my mom and my dad. And basically always had a dog growing up. But... They were always just mutts because we just always rescued them from the shelter um, until I was probably about 12 or 13. We got our first purebred dog and we got a little basset hound. She was adorable. She was eight weeks old and just, oh, the cutest little thing. But anyways, she was just baby. Uh, Gracie. Gracie. We named her Gracie. Yeah. And she would trip on her own ears, which was the cutest thing. That's hilarious. Uh, yeah, super sad. Super sad. Also really funny. But so I didn't know anything really about specific breeds i mean you know of them because like hunter one dalmatians and beethoven things like that kind of you know about specific breeds but we just always had mutts they were just our dogs german shepherds so, yeah for some reason every time i think of a dog breed i think of a german <laughs> shepherd it's always a german shepherd yeah so we got gracie she was a little basset hound with her big ears um but i learned a lot of things when we got her because she had a lot of health issues that we didn't, I never really took into account until it comes to specific breeds because there are things, um, you know, that affect them depending on physical traits and all sorts of stuff. So we learned pretty quickly that Gracie had like really droopy eyes and we probably had to do a surgery where we could stop that from being such a problem because she gets stuff in her eyes and then she get eye infections. Um, she smelled really bad and i am pretty sure it's because of like they have really long intestine because if you think about a basset hound it's like the longest dog okay. ever and they have like a really long digestive tract from what i believe i'm gonna have to research this obviously for the basset episode but i'm pretty sure it has to do with like how their digestive tract is set up because they have like really bad breath even if her teeth weren't bad like super bad breath really really gassy Hmm. So, yeah, they tend to have some weird, I was looking it up a little bit, and they do get, like, bloat and stuff, and it tends to happen in dogs that have, like, really deep chests, which they do. Basically, their chest almost touches the ground half the time. Interesting. But, yeah, so, she had some issues. <laughs> she had some issues that I'd never really thought about, so, until we had gotten a dog breed, or a specific breed, um, also learned, yeah, that they're definitely bred for certain jobs and she was a hound dog. So she was loud. And if she caught a whiff of something, she was out of there. Like she ran away from me, in my college house in Boulder, and she just took off down the street. Cause I was babysitting her for my parents and she smelled something and she just took the hell off and had to like chase her down the street. And luckily I was able hmm. to get her back. But she just like their ears, the reason that their ears are so long is it like whiffs oh, yeah, like the odor up, up in the, yeah, up into their nose. So they just That's like so weird. Yeah, forget it. Like she had tiny ass little legs, but she could haul ass. So yeah, learned quite a bit. But um basically it got me interested in wanting to know more about dogs. So 
I started looking for jobs in the dog field. And I ended up working at a place in Florida. It's called Waggle Brothers. Um, what was it actually called? It's like a pet spa. And f I don't know if there was some fancy name for it. But it was a dog bre or a boarding facility and a daycare. Um, and they also had grooming. So I started working there. And I learned quite a bit about just dogs in general. Um, I learned a little about the grooming. Didn't really do any of it. Um, but got to see like some pretty fancy haircuts because, you know, right. Miami people, they've got like their poodles and shit. I bring them in and want them to look all yeah not like a dog. <laughs> super <laughs> weird, super weird. So I got to learn a bit about that. Um, I didn't really work there very long because I had to move. But then when I got back to Colorado, I was able to get a job at a weird little doggy daycare retail slash grooming place in my hometown that had never existed before. So I went in there and I applied. I was able to get the job because I had experience, which was cool. Um, I started basically grooming, like, the very first day I was there. I gave... I can't remember what kind of a dog he was. I think he was an Aussie. Oh, he was an Aussie, and he was the biggest Aussie I've ever met. He was, like, 75 pounds. Jeez. Nobody ever believed the owner when she told him that it was an Aussie because they're like, no way, that dog's not... They don't get that big, but she had papers and everything. This dog was crazy. So... I grimmed that dog the very first day, pretty much, that I worked there. Oh, hold on. I need some water. <laughs> water break. Uncensored. Yeah, yeah. uncensored. <laughs> water break. But anyways, so, started grooming dogs, um, just basically giving them the baths, and drying them, and doing their nails, getting them ready to go to the groomer who would do the cut if they um, were getting one. Quickly moved up to actually doing the cuts, which was really cool. Only can do that in a small town when they're like, we don't care. We'll just teach you. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned some stuff. Um, but then, long story short, wasn't able to continue doing it because I injured myself and it's very labor intensive. And then, yeah, a lot of dogs like not down <laughs> with getting baths. It's super physical. Oh, mine's not. Yeah, for sure. Like, we wouldn't have even been able to do it. I gotta be in the we with like, him. Yeah, if you would have dropped him off there and been like, can you give him a daily special or whatever, you know, the bath and the towel dry, we would have called you, like, He's the minute the, the water turned on and be back. like, no. Or, you, yeah, or you get him back soaking <laughs> wet, covered in soap and everything. Like, yeah. nope, we're done. Sorry. <laughs> totally. Okay. Have soapy. We definitely sent dogs out that way, for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But after that job, then I had a quick little stint with a dog walking company. I started that. <laughs> only did it for like maybe two months not even i don't think but i started it in january in colorado <laughs> so basically i walked like a million dogs in blizzards and shit just like you're going to antarctica with like yeah. goggles and shit <laughs> yeah <laughs> when nobody else wants to be walking their dog but they're like rich people so they can pay you to walk their dog it was pretty yeah. hardcore that was me but it was really cool got to meet a lot of cool dogs um and other than jobs in the dog field i'm also a dog mom you've heard the one snoring um, we have three dogs. We have Fox and then we have Falcor. Like, yeah, forever. F the never ending story. Definitely. And then Apollo, um, didn't name that one. He just came that way. But I got both of them. I got two of them, Falcor and Apollo. When I was down in Florida, I rescued them. And then Fox is Dan's dog. So he's my little adopt a Fox, but adopt Fox. yeah, adopt a Fox. He's the so. one snoring for it. Yeah, if you hear if you hear some snoring in the background, that's that guy for sure. But basically, dogs are awesome. I've had them in my life a lot. I've learned a lot about them. Um, it's super fun to share that information with people. Just weird things that I mean, everybody loves dogs, but how many random, strange little facts do you know about them? So that is why I want to do this podcast, and that's my plan. So. How I want to have it set up is doing like an episode for a dog in each group that is um, recognized by the American Kennel Club. So I kind of want to go through those groups and then go from there, um, maybe get into more some more obscure breeds that are in these groups that maybe you haven't heard of. So probably start out pretty simple with dogs that you've heard of, but try to get you some weird facts, things that maybe you didn't know, um, and then you know, get a little more obscure from there. So Dan has the official list of the AKC groups <clears throat> that he is going to go through. Alrighty. 
These are the seven groups of dogs recognized by the American American Kennel Club. Yes. Yeah. So you got the sporting group, the herding group, the hound group, the working group, the terrier group, the non-sporting group, and the toy group. It's kind of funny to have a group defined by what they're not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like these yeah. dogs are not. Okay. <laughs> yeah, wait till you hear what's in that group. It will totally make sense. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's start back up at the top. Why don't you tell us what is going on with the sporting group? Okay. So the sporting group, they are dogs that assist hunters in capturing and retrieving feathered game. So these mm. are going to be all of the retrievers that you know, the golden retriever, the lab, um, German short-haired pointer is another Sporting one. Sporting means hunting then, not um, like Yes, frisbee not like and, agility or, or anything. Fly ball right, or whatever right. else. Yeah, sporting, sporting in a sense. But does that include like Ridgebacks, like where the dogs actually like hunting or just the dogs that... Ooh, like, I'm not sure because they do... Hunting assistance and whatnot. Yeah, because it says, I mean, their definition of it is that... It, they assist hunters in the capture and retrieval, so I'm not really sure about things that are more capture of like, and retrieval, yeah. more of like a protection thing, though. Right. Maybe so. I'm not really sure. It'll be interesting to see what group they fall I'm into. I don't even know. To the Ridgeback episode. Yeah, reasons, yeah, me too. Also that. That'll be super cool. So that's the sporting group. Um, yeah, like I said, labs, golden retrievers, German short-haired pointers, cocker spaniels, um, any of those dogs that you think of, you know, chasing the birds out or you know, catching the frisbee but it was originally for birds. Or then, like, the the dogs they breed to hunt bears and stuff, too, where, like, the dogs are actually doing... The hunting, the, hunting. The hunting or whatever. Yeah, that's probably going to be more of another group that comes up. Gotcha. Yeah. So what's the next group? The next group is the herding group. All right. Everybody, well, my favorite, one of them, um, the dogs that move livestock... They are the highly trainable dogs that you probably know as a border collie. My favorite, too. Oh, yeah, totally. I, we can never own one because they're crazy. Um, <laughs> also in this group, the German Shepherd, because you think of them as like, a, I think of them more of like a working dog, just in like the police, you know, scenario that they're in. cop dogs, yeah. Yeah, but they're actually like herding dogs, which makes sense. Shepherd mm, in yeah, their name. Yeah, sure, right. right. And then um, the Corgi, they believe it or not. Shepherd, you know. Drunk people and criminals now. Yeah, exactly. It's a different type of shepherding. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and then the corgi, which a lot of people... I mean, I didn't know this for a long time. You wouldn't think of, like, that short little dog. But it makes sense because they're all short mm. so that they don't get, like, kicked. Right. You know, as easily by cattle in the face. And Perfect ankle if you've fighting ever height. been around corgis, you know that they're well, herding see, dogs. You can see, like, the border collies and stuff have to bend way down to bite the mm -hmm. ankles. They're, like, the mostly on right all there. fours. Yeah, they, like, get on their belly and scoot, but corgis are already there. And if you've ever been around them... Yeah, more than one. Like, they definitely hurt you. Yeah, yeah. yeah they bite sure. your ankles and shit. Hey, All right, next group. Oh, sorry. I was looking at my dog. <laughs> the next group is the hound group. Okay, so these are the dogs that are used to track. So they're like sight hounds and scent hounds. So they're used... This might be more of like what you were talking about, where they're like... If they're going after and hunting something else. Right. So they might be in that group. Um, but these are also used even to track people. Da, da, da. Oh, yeah, totally. You know, like, Body dogs. And yeah, exactly. Avalanche like, dogs. Like, yeah, when all these bloodhounds yeah. are like, oh, 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 you know, like that, running around chasing like, convicts through the woods. I was watching something on TV late at night once, and I believe they said, as far as like avalanche dogs, they have to have two uh -huh. dogs every time they're doing it because they have one dog that's trained to find live people and one dog that's trying to find dead people they can't train the same dog to find both or whatever right or they're not thing they're not that. the yeah. same yeah, yeah for sure yeah, yeah. right crazy that was interesting so yeah we got all the hounds so of course in there we have like everything that has hound in the name <laughs> basset hound bloodhound dotson greyhound even blue tick hound yeah exactly I feel like the Tr I've coon, been... tree coon walker hound or something there's like a tree walking coon hound there's all sorts of hounds so those i've been be looking for my opportunity to bring up best in show and this yeah. kind of reminds me of when he's listing nuts yeah exactly blood hound coon hound blue tick coon hound that's where she'd lose it <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure and he had a hound yeah he was the hound guy in yeah the bloodhound for yeah. sure <laughs> hubert is his name hubert Something like that. Hubert. Something like, yeah. All right. What's our next group? <laughs> next group is the working group. Okay. So these are dogs that work. So like guarding 
like flocks, pulling sleds, protecting their territory and their people. The list that they gave of things that you would recognize is like weird. It's like Great Dane and Boxer. Um, husky, because pulling sleds. The AKC so. has such a interesting method to their madness on the groups. Like yeah, it is. Sporting is actually hunting, but also right. like hunting, if you're smelling, is hounding. You know. <laughs> but if, yeah, because it all goes back to like but what like, they recognized a really long time ago. Is not working? Like, that's not a job. But if you're guarding them, it's, it's a job. But if you're moving them around, it's not, you're not working. You're, right. you know, it's just interesting how much overlap there is, like, in the at least commonplace definitions of the words they use to define mm-hmm. their groups, and it makes it like confusing. Yeah, for sure. So, like what dogs would be where. Yeah, because then when you actually like go into it, you kind of learn a little bit more about like which ones were bred and why they were bred and how long. You know, like they've been around some of them for a super super long time. So like right. things that were we were using dogs for then, like maybe weren't even a thing later on. You know, like. Like, are the periods or regions sense. where we were breeding dogs for smelling stuff. Right. was all sort of defined by certain characteristics, as we know with hound dogs, which all are kind of similar to each other in, different, in certain ways, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it is pretty weird. I'm interested to, like, learn more about all the groups. It's kind of why I wanted to, like, split it up this way, to just right. see a little bit more what they mean. But what's yeah. the next one? The next one, we did working, right? The next yes. group is the terrier group. We All got, right. Oh, we got a couple of those too. Yeah, for well, sure. A couple of mixes. They're definitely like terrier mutts, which everybody tells you that their dog is like a terrier. But <laughs> they were originally bred to like hunt things underground, like rodents and other vermin. So they were actually like, yeah, they were going underground. So gotcha. it makes sense that if you know a Jack Russell or anything. So that's <laughs> originally what the group the was The terrier for. group, yep. But then you end up with like. Like pit bulls? Are they terriers? Staffordshire terrier? Yeah, and like a that pit kind bull of terrier. So they're like, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not really sure if those are all gonna be like. It's like AKC, like puts if they're them in actually a yeah group or not or right. Yeah, it's right. one of those like. Or if they're even like recognized really by the AKC, there's like breeds out there that like aren't actually recognized. That's true like too, I don't yeah. think they recognize like Labradoodle or anything. You know, right? Like, it's weird. They're like really like strict on what they like allowing whoops but in this group so other terriers are like um the scotty or the west highland terrier so the scottish terrier so they're like little wiry short little legs usually like neurotic and trying to hunt shit all the time yeah rat hunters yeah and then the next group the one that you were questioning the (laughs) non-sporting so this is just everybody else so if it's like an akc breed but they don't fit in any of those other categories they fall into the non-sporting group. So this is where you'll see, like, the bulldog, because Lord knows gotcha. that they don't, like, they don't do anything. <laughs> like where a pit bull might be. Or yeah, something. the Dalmatian well, was, was it, another like, one that I think they, they must recognize pit bulls as something, because weren't they in, wasn't there one in Westminster that I we feel were like we rooting saw. for yeah. last year or something? Yeah, if nothing, or it was a staffy. Ago, Could have been. Staff for sure. Staff yeah. for sure. But yeah, so the, the non-sporting group is just basically everybody else. And then the last group. The toy group. Those are basically bred to just be carried around and sit on your lap and be in your purse and be pushed in a stroller. They're like all the little things that just, you know, chihuahuas, pugs, shih tzus, like, I don't know, little companion, companion yeah. purse dogs. So, yeah, but those are all of those groups. So we'll go into more detail, like once we actually start hitting the episodes and putting the dogs into those groups and we'll bring it up throughout because it's you know it'll correlate to why the breed of that dog is the way that they are Alrighty. so also in the layout so we're going to have them split up by the categories and then um we'll go into the physical characteristics of dogs so for instance um their coat whether it's the texture the length or the color the size of the dog, what kind of ears they have, um, do they have short legs, do they have deep chests, just the physical characteristics um, that make, you know, make up the dog. Um, and then we'll go into the personality traits. So are they loyal, protective, high energy, playfulness, the things that are super important to know if you're going to let a certain breed into your life. Um, you should probably have an idea of what they're going to act like. So... 
Next from there, we're go- of course, we'll go into some origin. So like the where and when they were, where did they come from? Who was breeding them? Why were they even breeding them? Right. Um, <clears throat> and then the history, which is like the why and what were they bred for? And were they like corgis that the queen had? Just like weird little stories that have to do with that breed that people right. may not know about that we find interesting or whatever. We'll just look for some of those. Um, and then, so that's pretty much it for each episode that's going to be, like, set on a specific dog breed. Make sense? Got it. Okay. Um, and then from there, this is not set in stone or anything, but I do want to start doing other weekly shows, um, with guests, which I think that's a super exciting part. Um, really want to just talk to some other people. Your guest list is actually already starting to fill up. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. I've already had, like, people, (laughs) like, can I be on it? I'm like, man, I had you on there already. You know who I'm talking about. You know I'm talking about you, (laughs) if you're listening to this. Um, (laughs) So, yeah, we're going to have some fun people on. Just people who are also in the dog industry, um, trainers, people who work in rescue, um, veterinarians, maybe. He's not even on my list. I need to put him on there. Right. Yeah. And then also just, like, regular dog people yeah just everybody wants to talk about their dog because honestly like people just yeah you just met them and they're like want to see a picture of my dog one of my favorite things about like (laughs) talking to people about dogs their dogs and stuff is like especially if they have a mutt like Mm -hmm. trying to figuring out like what like we think like you know what mix we think the dog is yeah and like sort of trying to apply those standards of those particular breeds right to that dog's particular behavior and capacity for learning and other stuff like that and like actually being able to see that right for real is one of the things that like sort of like affirms the the realness of like breeds versus mutts versus how it all how yeah. it all works and that you can actually do like have like you can really see it dogs that's cool. are like <laughs> this really one weird specific way and it's like really hard to get it out of them you know what i mean yeah you mix yeah. them with other dogs or train them other ways and stuff it's like right it's just interesting. there's certain things that just we bred for them and they've really stuck around <laughs> yeah. for sure. Even like through all the muttness. And people can be like that too, maybe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so also on top of having guests, I'm going to do some random episodes um, just about dog specific topics. Um, I'd love to hear from people if you guys are interested in certain things, because I'm always down to learn about stuff in the dog industry. But for instance, like, a lot of people have been doing the CBD oil for their pets. Um, so we could go do an episode about that. We could do one about nutrition. We could do one about... Fireworks. Fireworks for sure. On leash versus off leash. Just any other kind of like dog topics I think would be fun to go into. So totally. that's what the podcast is looking like at this point. Um, but as far as today's go, today's episode goes... Um, yeah, we're going to get into the history of dogs and their relationship with people. All right. So dogs have been around since, I don't know, basically forever. Um, and I'm not wrong in not knowing the, an exact date, as it's been debated by scientists and researchers for a very long time. Um, according to an article from Ancient.eu titled Dogs in the Ancient World, which was published in January of 2019, quote, the oldest dog remains in the world found thus far dated to 31,700 years ago. I guess this specimen is referred to as Vegas 1, end quote. I know, that's insane. That's a really, really long time ago. Um, The article continues, quote, this Paleolithic dog most resembled the Siberian Husky, Vegas 1. The findings of the 2008 study are challenged by dog remains found in the Goyet Caves of Belgium, which dated to 36,500 years ago, end quote. Um, also from another article titled The Origins of Dogs from Discover Magazine, quote, oh, I'm going to butcher this name, <laughs> Germain Pre. I don't know, who set off a firestorm in 2008 when she described a 36,000-year-old Leo to scene. It's it's a it's a time period. Dog from Belgium's Goyet Cave. The remains, which included a partial skull, were found in the 1860s in a limestone cave, along with lynx, mammoth, and other animals. 
The Goya individual was labeled a wolf in field notes until Germont Prey compared details in the size and shape of its skull and teeth with modern wolves and dogs and other ancient canids. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Again. So even though the findings of the earlier study are now being questions, questioned, it is in no doubt that either way, dogs have been around for a long damn time. You'll notice as I have, if you research the origins of dogs, you'll get a mix of all sorts of answers, thus making it hard to give a straight answer, to get a straight answer. I could probably solely research where dogs come from and have an entire podcast just about that. However, since I don't want to do that, um, I just want to try and convey the basics I'll leave further research up to you if you feel the need to do so. One of the most common, probably the most common answers as to where dogs come from is that they evolved from wolves. We've definitely all heard this one. If you get the chance to check out um, this article, I'm going to put it in here a couple times. It's got some really great points. Um, it's on LiveScience.com, titled Ancient Wolf DNA Could Solve Dog Origin Mystery. It's written by Bess Becky Oskin, and it's fascinating. So a few quotes from this article. Quote, while it was once believed that all dogs descended from the gray wolf, newer research indicates that canines can trace their ancestry to prehistoric wolves that roamed Eurasia between 9,000 and 34,000 years ago. So what's interesting here is that, quote, same article, genetic evidence from an ancient wolf bone discovered lying on the tundra in Siberia's Tamir Peninsula reveals that wolves and dogs split from their common ancestor at least 27,000 years ago, which is crazy. They did not know that before. From the article I talked about before the origin of dogs, Germont, Germont Prey says, quote, I have a background in Pleistocene mammals and the others generally specialize in Neolithic or after the Ice Age. She says, as a researcher focused on an earlier period, she was more comfortable than some of her peers in accepting that domestication prior to the advent of agriculture, roughly 12,000 years ago, was even possible. So, for a long time, people just thought that dogs were domesticated at the same time as agriculture, because that's usually how it goes with most animals when they're domesticated. So that's pretty interesting. I say hooray for continuous process um, or progress in the field of research. And because of this, it brings up the question, if the split between dogs and wolves happened far earlier than we had originally thought, is it possible that domestication happened earlier also? Something to think about. Um, from the same article, quote, the archaeological records of domestication and agriculture go hand in hand for all species but one, the dog. The newest studies provide the most robust confirmation yet that the domesticated dog evolved when humans were still hunter-gatherers, which is crazy. One of the main classes is hunting dogs, so... Right. Yeah. Probably one of the first. So, think like the more docile of the wolves following people around while they hunted, attracted to their trash, and the way that they, like, set up the environment to attract them. Right. So that's another thing that researchers and scientists can't seem to agree on. There's been a bit of back and forth. Some say domestication only happened once, whereas others would argue that it could have happened multiple times and actually in multiple locations. So that's like a whole, that's a whole nother thing of trying to get into like where they think it came from. It's all over the place because of remains that they found in certain areas actually buried with people, which is kind of cool. So that like... So well, that just makes up. sense, though, because everybody loves dogs. Yeah, yeah. So we have forever. So as long as, like, ever since the domestication process happened, they've been, like, our companions, you know? That they've been, like, buried with us. Which has happened a way long time ago. What's up with, like, wolves, though? What's up with the wolves? Oh, well, they think that, like... That they have a common ancestor that, like, but actually that ancestor doesn't even exist. So it's, like, really complicated as far as, like, it goes a little bit. I go into a little bit more of, like, the wolf right. kind of stuff in, in a field. Okay. Yeah. Um, so 
there's been a back a, a, a little bit of back and forth. Some say the domestication only happened once, whereas others would argue that it's happened multiple times in multiple locations. So an article from Discover Magazine, the author writes, quote, Recent genetic studies have placed ground zero for dog domestication in Europe, Central Asia, the Middle East, South Asia, or Southeast Asia. <laughs> and they date dog origins anywhere between 10,000 and 38,000 years ago. You know, because they found like that 36,000 year old dog. So, I know, it's a lot of info. Um, so, it's a lot to try to take in when looking at that. So, for a quick little history on domestication, there are typically three ways that animals are domesticated. Prey, directed, and commensal. So, prey domestication is where person hunts the animal, doesn't kill it, obviously, usually a large herbivore, um, and keeps it around for future use. So the most common animals domesticated this way are what we, you know, cows, pigs, things right. like that, livestock Chickens. animals. Mm -hmm. Right. Then there's directed domestication. And this is used for animals that are used for transport, so such as horses. They're taken out of the wild and bred for a specific use. And then you just keep them, and you keep them away from their wild counterparts or whatever, uh -huh. you know, and you domesticate them that way. And then the last form of domestication is commensal, and this occurs when people unintentionally create an environment that attracts an animal. So, a good example of this is cats. People started storing grain, along came rats, cats followed. Over generations, the human appreciates some benefit that the animal provides, like Barn cats. Were we in some ways domesticating the rats, too? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Like, we're not going to get anything out of them, but we're going to feed them. So Create an environment that... It's not really domestication like. that, like, works towards people's advantage, yeah. I guess. At least cats can be cool. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. But cats are weird, too, because, like, when you when we domesticated them... They don't like travel well and whatnot, so it didn't do what dogs kind of did, right. you know? Because like once people were domesticating dogs and they were still hunters and gatherers and they're moving around, they're taking dogs elsewhere. Those dogs are breeding with wolves. There's a bunch of other weird shit right. going on. But like cats, this is going to be like, no, they came around fuck like, you, stay near. You don't like me and I don't like you, but I see you've accidentally domesticated a bunch of rats. <laughs> <laughs> right. I can take care so. of that for you for some warm milk. Yeah, exactly. And I'll hang out here while the conditions persist, you know, but Take I'm probably not going to, like, follow you to your next spot. Yeah, so I thought those were pretty interesting, different ways to domesticate things. So says back, so back to the article from The Origins of the Dogs, that article, I really, I really encourage everybody to read it. I will put the link somewhere so you guys can find it because it's awesome. Um, but it says, quote, dogs may have undergone a similar process. Um, we see how it could have happened in wolves, says Larson. There was a population that just started hanging out with us, subsisting off our environment we were creating. Only after generations did humans start intentionally creating populations. And only long after that did we get crazy things like labradoodles. <laughs> From the same article, it says, other researchers, however, including pen vets Serpel, Doubt human hunter gatherers would have tolerated large predators near their camps, or that the resource frugal humans would have even left behind enough potential food to sustain a wolf sized animal. Instead, they argue it's possible that prehistoric humans, like many more recent hunter gatherer groups, had a custom of adopting baby animals, just like so taking I was a thinking about baby too, wolf. a puppy, you know, you find yep. a puppy or whatever, and you're like, aw. Yeah, totally. I'm bringing this home with me. Right. So it says, a hand-reared ancestral wolf, Serpel argues, would develop an intense familial bond with humans. That animal, oh, quote, that animal, as an adult, would be sufficiently socialized to be safe, end quote, in the, end of, in the eyes of the hunter-gatherer, says Serpel. So I thought that was pretty cool to think about the first relationships between, like, dog and man, if they were just, like grabbing little baby wolves or if like one of the wolves that wasn't as like mean in the pack who's kind of like my pack's a bunch of jackasses maybe i'll chill with right. you guys instead you know and yeah. then just like slowly you know you start breeding those ones with each other and it just like weird 
Super That's our dog Fox snoring up. By the way, I don't know if you folks at home can <laughs> yeah, hear that. Yeah, but he probably rips, he can. He pretty pretty solid. Yeah, he's he's pretty loud. Um, but it was cool because it seemed like some a bunch of people in some of the articles that I read were just kind of like it doesn't really seem like we domesticated dogs so much as it was like something that we kind of did together because from the get go they basically right. had like jobs, you know, yeah. which is really cool. Um. Here's a segment from the Smithsonian Magazine article. Real quick, article. though, like, I just thought, like, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, like, if you find a little stray wolf puppy or whatever and, like, bring it home, you're like, okay, but once it's, like, a wolf, right? you know, we got to get rid of it or whatever kind of thing, you know? But right. then, it's like, a weird thing happens and you raise this wolf puppy and it's, like, not as much of a wolf anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Like... Even people that have, like, weird pet alligators and stuff, like... Yeah. Which, I'll get into that later about why... Alligators still gonna bite you or whatever, but... Part of the reason <clears throat> from this new study, I'm maybe a couple years old, but it's really cool that I talk about it later, and it has to do with um, actual, like, chemical reactions that happen between... In the brain, like, between, like, people and dogs. Interesting. And the way that, like, the reason dogs are the animal that other animals aren't. Like, right. there are a lot of animals. Why do we only have this connection, like we do, with dogs? Yeah. Like, it's not even the same with cats. It's not yeah. the same like, with I your livestock. Like, I had a cat that I loved as much as I loved my dog, but he just he didn't feel the same way my dog feels about me. You yeah, know, like, right. <clears throat> There's was, info later on that. It was with the cat, you know? There's info about that. I wanted to make sure to put it in this episode, just so that we could kind of lay out why every single person loves dogs. What's the deal with that? Dogs love us, strange? and they're just, yeah, they're just awesome. So, um, back to, yeah, domesticating wolves or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Says, so I have a segment from the Smithsonian Magazine article. It's titled, How Accurate is Alpha's Theory of Dog Domestication? And it's got another point of view on the domestication issue. So this author writes, quote, since more recent genetic studies suggest that the date of domestication occurred far, far earlier, a different theory has gained the support of many scientists. Survival of the friendliest suggests that wolves largely domesticated themselves among hunter-gatherer people. So, like, the friendliest ones that are walking up to your camp and, you know, not attacking you for your food or whatever. That is, the first domesticated animal was a large carnivore who would have been a competitor for food. Anyone who spent time with wild wolves would see how unlikely it is that we somehow tamed them in a way that led to domestication, <laughs> says Brian Hare, director of the Duke University Canine Cognition Center. But, Hare notes, the physical changes that appear in dogs over time, including splotchy coats, curly tails, and floppy ears, follow a pattern of a process known as self-domestication. It's what happens when the friendliest animals of a species somehow gain an advantage. Friendliness somehow drives these physical changes, which can begin to appear as visible byproducts of this selection in only a few generations. Quote, evidence for this comes from another process of domestication, one involving the famous case of domesticated fox in Ru foxes in Russia. Hey, fox. This experiment bred foxes who were comfortable getting close to humans, but researchers learned that these comfortable foxes were also good at picking up on human social cues explains Lori Santos, director of the Canine Cognition Center at Yale University. The selection of social foxes also had the unintended consequence of making them look increasingly adorable, like dogs. Hare adds that most wolves would have been fearful and aggressive towards humans, because that's the way most wolves behave. But some would have been friendlier, which may have given them access to human hunter-gatherers. So it only takes a couple generations of dogs to, like, physically look cuter i read that That's in another weird. article too they were talking about like the puppiness that like happened like look at a golden retriever's face right you know like it's just nothing about that is like wolf-like <laughs> at all but it's just like this weird self-domestication look more like a teddy bear thing i don't know it's pretty crazy i thought that was weird but it makes i mean makes a bit of sense domestication's weird and i've proven through all of this thus I feel far like we're already programmed to be like complex like maternally inclined towards like cute stuff mm -hmm. 
I'm eternal is the right word. Just wait, I'm almost there. I'm almost Sorry. to where we can talk <laughs> about that. It's awesome. It's cool that you've brought it up. Good. I'm glad that I like added it in here. Make sure that it was part of it. Okay. Is that all right? So, so now that we sort of know where dogs came from and sort of how they came to be, I mean, I guess. Now let's look at the last section of today's episode. Why do we love them so much? Oh, yay, we're here. Okay. Well, some of it actually comes down to science, like I've said. You've probably heard of a positive feedback loop, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> Science Magazine Online has a great article, and it is tiled titled How Dogs Stole Our Hearts, and it's perfect. In this article, the author writes about a very interesting study done by an animal animal behaviorist at Azabu University in Sagamihara, Japan. His name is Takafumi Kikusui. Oh, yes. That sounded right. I think I got it. Okay. His lab studies <laughs> oxytocin, which is a hormone that plays a role in maternal bonding, trust, and altruism. So, the article states, Quote, dogs are already renowned for their ability to interact with humans. It's not just the walks and the frisbee catching. Canines seem to understand us in a way that no other animal does. Point at an object, for example, and a dog will look at where you're pointing. This is me, sometimes. An intuitive reading of your intentions, like, I'm trying to show you something. That confounds our closest relatives, chimpanzees. People and dogs also look into each other's eyes while interacting, a sign of understanding and affection that dogs' closest relatives, wolves, actually interpret as hostility. Kikosui, this is still from the article, and his colleagues convinced 30 of their friends and neighbors to bring their pets into his lab. They also found and reached out to a few people who were raising wolves as pets. When each owner brought his or her animal into the lab, the researchers collected urine from both and then asked the owners to interact with their animal in a room together for 30 minutes. During this time, the owners typically petted their animals and talked to them. Dogs and their owners also gazed into each other's eyes. Aww. Some for a, a total of a couple of minutes. Some just for a few seconds. The wolves, not surprisingly, didn't make much eye contact with their owners. After the time was up, the team took their urine samples again. Mutual gazing had a profound effect on both the dogs and their owners. Of the duos that had spent the greatest amount of time looking into each other's eyes, both male and female dogs experienced a 130% rise in oxytocin levels, and both male and female owners a 300% increase. Damn. Kikasui was one of them, participating in the experiment himself with his two standard poodles, Anita and Jasmine. <laughs> That's cute. The scientists saw no oxytocin increase in the dogs and owners who had spent little time gazing at each other, or in any of the wolf-owner duos. This guy's dog's names were Anita and Jasmine? Yeah. Isn't that like... Oh. That's so funny. <laughs> that's funny. We have two friends that work together oh, oh, um, named Anita and Jasmine. And our barista they're ladies. Great. Yeah, they're baristas. Oh my that's God. That's so, so funny. That's really funny. When I first read that, I didn't... I didn't <laughs> okay, still from the same article. I had to put a lot in here Wait, from this. so did you say that wolves <clears throat> interpret pointing as aggression? No, like eye contact. Oh, eye contact. Eye contact. Eye contact. Eye contact. But you said that chimpanzees or monkeys or something don't understand pointing yeah according to some of the research that i looked up yeah that's what they say is like they don't because i was doing that last night after i was researching this like sitting there with falcor and like all i did was just like point into his crate like of course they know to go in there but he'd been like hanging out well, dogs definitely know about pointing yeah it's crazy it's just cats like, don't know yeah cats don't understand no. pointing Cats don't understand that. Like, why are you waving your hand around? I don't <laughs> get what's going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless you got food in there or something. I don't care. Yeah. I'm not really sure. Weird. It is weird. It's just like this thing. Like dogs just, they've always just gotten us. There's been part of them. It's just somewhere yeah. along the line, they just were chilling with us enough. Man's best just, friend. Stuff like that yeah. doesn't come from nowhere. Like, right. There's a reason. Yeah. Dogs yeah. are like it's just so on some it's weird level. Such a complicated sure. issue to like get all the way into. It's crazy. But from the same article, it still says, because I had to put a lot in here, because it's awesome. The results suggest that human-dog interactions elicit the same type of oxytocin positive feedback loop as seen between mothers and their infants. The positive feedback loop, he says, may have played a critical role in dog domestication. As wolves were morphing into dogs, only those that could bond with humans would have received care and protection. Fair enough. And humans themselves 
may have evolved the ability to reciprocate, adapting the maternal bonding feedback loop to a new species. It says, quote, Our biggest speculation, says Kigasui, who suggests that because oxytocin decrease anxiety, the adaptation may have been important for human survival as well. Quote, if human beings are less stressed out, it's better for their health. That's so true. Having a dog. And they bring dogs to, like, sick people in the hospital yeah. and shit, too. Having a dog literally makes your life better. It's just gonna... Your oxytocin levels are gonna be off the chart. Just look your dog in the eye. Just hang out. <laughs> watch watch some Netflix. Stare into your dog's eyes. Bonding time. Thought that was super interesting. Yeah, cool. After learning this, it makes complete sense that my heart feels like it's gonna explode when I look at my dogs, or that my <laughs> voice gets like three octaves too high anytime I see a dog. <laughs> you know exactly. Yeah, anybody who knows me knows exactly what I'm talking about. So we like have a literal chemical connection to our dogs, and the study shows that it's reciprocal. Super cool. Um, what I also find interesting is that, as stated above, we're able to communicate with dogs in a way that even confounds our closest relatives, like we were talking about before, chimps. I mean, if you've ever, ever interacted with a dog in your life, which if you haven't, you have to live under a rock. Like, no, probably not even that. They'll find you there. But if you've ever interacted with a dog, you understand that this is totally a thing. It's almost like we're made for each other. Oh, <laughs> totally. I knew it. So, there's obviously an insane amount of research that goes into learning all that there is to know about the origin of dogs. Just that alone. Um, but you get into the domestication and the bond they share with their humans. Um, I only touched the surface in this episode. But I hope you learned something um, that maybe you never heard before. And now that you have an overview of dogs in general and hopefully understand a bit more about domestication, we've set the stage to talk about specific breeds. So next week, we're going to look at mutts. I know, although they're not really a breed and they're not part of the AKC categories that I mentioned, I'm going to, you know, put everybody else in, they're super important to look at. Like, a large percentage of dogs are mutts. In fact, all three of our dogs are uh, a mix of Lord knows what. So I played the what's the breed game with them all the time. Maybe someday we'll actually do the DNA test and see. But given what I know about dogs, I think I have a pretty good guess. Yeah. Yeah, you too. You're, you're on it. I think so. So why are mutts so important to cover for our, our first breed episode? Well, they're a little bit of everything. So without specific breeds, obviously we wouldn't have mutts. And in many cases, mutts are a collection of the best traits of each breed in their lineage. Like, hell, some newer breeds even like started off as being mutts. Looking at you, Labradoodle. Basically, mutts are awesome. They deserve an episode. So if you enjoyed today's show, be sure to tune in next week when we give the spotlight to mutts of all kinds. Thank you guys so much for listening today um, to our first episode of Chew On This, Dog Food for Thought with Kimberly. Until next time. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you like the show, please help me out by subscribing on YouTube or whatever podcasting platform you found me on. And don't forget to share the show with all of your dog-loving friends. You can also find me on social at Chew With Kim on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Check out my show blog for articles and links on Medium at Chew On This Dogcast. You can also sign up for my email list or send me comments and questions at chewonthisdogcast at gmail.com. And visit anchor.fm slash chewwithkim for an up-to-date list of all the podcasting platforms where the show is available and to listen on the web. Thanks again for all of your support, and until next time, chew on this! <laughs>